Hello, folks. Welcome to the Veterans Corner, another episode. Uh, we have, this is actually part two. I'm Chuck Wooden, I'll be your host. I'm joined by my co-host, Megan Dooley. Hey there, yeah. nice to have you. Yeah. Uh, well, it, good it, to be here. It, it's, it's great to have you here, uh, as always. You know, uh, Justine, I don't, this is part two. Hopefully the, the, our viewers watched part one. Oh, there you go. If you uh, didn't, go look for yeah, it. Yeah, you know, I think we're gonna recap a little bit in the beginning anyways, but uh, if you didn't watch part one, uh, mental health has been a, a big topic for the Veterans Corner. It's, a, it's an ex extremely important topic. Uh, this particular time, we're going to be talking about the importance of families and veterans' lives and why we need the, the support, their support as well. Yeah. Uh, Justine, she's no stranger to the show, uh, none whatsoever. She's been here a lot, always a great show, always and very informative. Uh, she is the community health director at the Farmington Valley Health District. Yes. She, she's a registered nurse. She has so many titles that we don't have time <laughs> on this show to, uh, she, she's the founder and president of Resilience Grows here. Um, I'll take it, yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's, and, and we're gonna stop there, otherwise we, we, we're dipping into- My head's gonna get so big, I'm not gonna fit on it, set anymore. Well, it's, and, and, and trust me, we've had that happen here before, so. <laughs> That's uh, why we're a little bit spaced further. Yeah, there you it, go. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, if, if, if you missed the first show, uh, part one of this series, please go back and try to find it. It, it, it was extremely informative. Um, it, it was a great show, and this is going to tie all that together, yeah. which is, you know, wh one of the questions I want to ask you is, what got you into this field? <laughs> the $50 million question, yeah. huh? So um, when I was in Australia, I was um, a registered nurse by training, and I was a intensive care specialist, so the, the predominance of my practice was working in intensive care and working with families at the worst day of their lives. I mean, I was never somebody that you saw on a happy day. Um, life wasn't going well when you were on my ward. And so I became really interested in mental health and you know how human beings for whatever reason some people are more resilient they seem to be able to cope with more adversity than others and you know can we actually teach resilience yeah. if someone doesn't have that natural predisposition towards it so it became something that i was very passionate about and has kind of followed me through my my travels and i've worked in schools and i've built program development and uh, then I came to America and for the last 10 years I've been at the Farmington Valley Health District working as their community health coordinator and mental health underpins everything about a human being. Um, you can write all kinds of wonderful health programming but if you don't understand why somebody feels the way they do, if you don't understand what's causing a person to engage in the types of health related behaviours, you don't stand a chance of fixing it. So mental health has always been at the, the, the base of what I've wanted to do. So. The opportunity came up um, about seven years ago for us to apply for a grant with the Movember Foundation. Yep. And they very generously have sponsored us for the last seven years and we were able to build a veterans mental health program, recognizing that our veterans, as we said in, on the last show, less than half of 1% of the American population raised their hand to serve this country. Yeah. But those individuals are some of the bravest human beings I've ever worked with and we owe them so much and we owe them resilient and mentally health, mental health literate communities. Yeah. yeah thank you. There was a question I wanted to ask the last show. <laughs> that was a very long answer. Yeah, well, no, it, it, it was very, I mean, it, it, was, it, it was something we were looking for. Uh, it, as always, it's just an absolute honor to have you here. Oh, thank you for L having me. We got so much information that we want to talk about, so let's jump into it. Yes, RGH, so you provide a critical resource to veterans, not only to veterans, but also their family members and their friends. So what is the work of RGH and why is it so important? <laughs> so I think again on the other show, we talked a little bit about, we did some research in our first 12 months of having this grant and we really wanted to understand the conditions in which veterans return to our community. Um, and we worked with veterans and we worked with members of the National Guard and we worked with active service members and their families. And it became very clear very early on that families are the, 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 the core center of the veteran. And if we don't work with the families, we don't serve the veteran. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, often the families are the very first to know that something's not right. They're the ones that know the veteran best and yeah. they're the ones that live with them at home in that, that, that space where a veteran probably is able to be the most real. And they know when something's not right. And often it's the family that is the first person to reach out for help. So yeah. Resilience Grows here has worked very hard to build um, programs that work with families and offer family support so that they in turn can support their veteran. That is profound. But I, you said that without the families and the communities, the veterans don't really have anybody to turn to when they are in their most critical moment. So why did you choose, I, I, you, talked, you talked about this before, but why did you choose specifically to assist the families and the communities of these veterans? So let's, probably the best way to answer that question, Megan, is to look at a veteran's experience or an active service member's experience in two ways. Let's talk about the period of a um, active service member's life when they're deploying and returning from deployment. So, those active service members have a family, whether they're married or they're not married, whether they've got children, they're somebody's child, they're somebody's son mm -hmm. or daughter, um, they have community ties, they have jobs, they have, you know, in, they have a life outside of the military before they begin. And while they are getting ready to deploy, there's a lot of mental challenges that go into deployment for somebody who serves. Mm. There's a lot of adjustments. They've got to get into the mindset yep. of leaving everything they love, leaving everything they know, getting into that, that mode of deployment and what's it going to be like and what's my job. And a lot of the time they're going to really dangerous places. So there's a lot of fear about what they're, they're going into. And, you know, they've got to get into the game. Their mind's got to get into the game. But they're leaving behind a family that has to keep going while their member is away. So mm. the family has to try to keep things normal. They've got to, if someone's married, they've got to keep the kids going backwards and forwards to school. The mortgage has got to get paid. The lawns have got to get mowed. The dog's got to go to the vet. Um, they have to try to keep home base or they try to keep home base what the veteran remembers so yeah. that when they come home it's something that they feel safe and that they you know they come the back to what zone. they left there's a comfort zone so there's a huge responsibility that goes with that but there's a lot of struggles and pressure that goes with that um, then we talk about when a veteran does return home and everything's not quite as rosy as they had anticipated perhaps their homecoming was a little more fantasyful than it actually is yeah. um, the lawns still need to get mowed the trash still needs to get taken out. Uh, life has gone on whilst they've been away. Um, people have assumed new roles. People have had to take on roles that perhaps weren't theirs to begin with, and now they don't want to relinquish them. You've got someone who's been deployed for six or 12 months. Now suddenly you learn to fix the car and you manage to deal with the broken fridge and you know, you've done everything. And now this family member comes home and wants those pieces back. Yeah not that easy. They want to feel you know, needed again. They want to feel needed exactly. again. Yeah. But you know, their children have grown, their children have moved on in terms of where they are in development and who their friends are and communities keep moving and changing. So there's a lot of stress and struggle on the return home. Now let's fast forward and talk about when someone leaves the military. So now we have an individual who has served and most of our veterans loved their job. They loved their time in service. They joined because it was what they wanted to do. Now they come back into a community and it doesn't feel the same. What's their purpose? Where do they belong? Are they, are they feeling as fulfilled as they did when they were on deployment? Do they have the same network of, of friends or battle buddies who now are scattered across the country? Mm. So those people who talk their talk, who understand what they've seen, are no longer sleeping in the bunk right next to them. They're halfway across the country. So In a different time zone. In too. a different time zone. And who do you belong to? Civilian life is really um, challenging for someone who's been in the military for any length of time. You know, in the military, someone asks you to do something, you don't ask, do you want me to do it now or later? You do it now. You do it, now. <laughs> you do it yesterday. Um, try being a veteran who's now working in the civilian workplace and working with a lot of um, our youth. Would you mind doing such and such? Yeah, I'll get around to it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cut so well yeah. for the average, yeah. It's, it's a whole different world. So, and the interdependence in workplaces and families isn't quite the same as a battle buddy out on the battlefield. The stakes aren't as high. 
So that alone can be a challenge, but now we've also got the residual issues of, of deployment, sometimes some mental health challenges, PTS, traumatic brain injury, moral injury, um, physical injury. And now our families have to take on a whole new role. They've got to become the caregiver. Big challenges. Yeah. You know, the, the, uh, one of the questions I was going to ask is, I, I think we've covered a lot of this. I don't know if you want to touch any more on it, is why are families so important to the veterans and, and what types of roles do they perform? Sure. I, I think so I think maybe the family as a caregiver is a really important one because, you know, in my experience of working with veterans and their families, veteran families are some of the most protective human beings on the planet. If your loved one has raised their hand to serve this country yeah. and has endured at times the unthinkable, your desire to protect them, your desire to accommodate the challenges that they're dealing with, you are a ferocious advocate. And what we can find happens is there's shame that goes with some of the mental health challenges because mm. society shames us. It's not a shame that the veteran or the family should be carrying, but society says, well, that's not what we expect, so therefore you need to keep that behind closed doors. So that whole white picket fence concept becomes a reality. So if you're, uh, you are the loved one of a veteran who is struggling with mental health challenges or, or um, addiction issues, your reluctance to put your hand up, a lot of that is about shame. And a lot of that is about you don't want to bring any additional challenges into the world of the person who's already sacrificed so much. So the role as a caregiver is exhausting and knowing when to ask for help can also be difficult because you don't want to betray the trust of the person that you love. Yeah. So how do, you, how do you walk that tightrope? Recognising that something's not going well at home, there's some dysfunction starting to occur, maybe you've got children and there's issues that are starting to bubble under the surface in the, in the home front. How do you help your veteran to navigate those challenges whilst advocating for the kids, whilst having the financial pressures of sometimes a disabled veteran? Now all of the financial pressures are on the caregiver's head, plus they're the full-time caregiver. So how do you balance all of that and know where to go for help or how to ask for help? You know, that, that, that comes up to the next question we were gonna ask is about the pressures, the pressures yeah. that the family have. Absolutely, and you know, we talk a lot about on, on the shows that we've done together yeah. about the, the pressures that a veteran feels and the challenges that a veteran feels with PTS and moral injury. You know, one of the things that we need to highlight is the caregiver burnout factor for the families. So if you have a veteran who is struggling with multiple issues and trying very hard to lead as normal a life as they can, there's a family behind that veteran, be it a husband or a wife or adult children or teenagers, a mother and a father, aunts, uncles, you know, selected family and friends who are really picking up the slack and they're carrying a lot of that to try to support that veteran. And over time, that becomes an enormous challenge to do long term without additional assistance. So when we, we work with veteran families, we, we see a lot of caregiver burnout. And believe it or not, caregiver burnout looks a lot like the same sort of burnout that a veteran feels when they come back from deployment. Yeah. So, you know, we see inter interrupted sleep patterns. We see an inability to concentrate. We see, you know, a feeling of being overwhelmed and not being able to cope. We, f we have an element of irritability, a feeling of compassion fatigue. You know, if you are spending all of your time supporting a person who is struggling with um, physical or mental health challenges, it can be really hard to be compassionate 24 hours a day. But then there's guilt if you're not. Yeah because I should be, that's my job. So part of our role at Resilience Grows Here with our families is really helping to put that protective net underneath them and connect them to other caregivers so that just like our veterans need peers, our caregivers need peers. They need other people who are walking that same walk. We've, we've had uh, uh, guests on the show before. Uh, I don't know if that organization's still around. If, if, if it is, we'll probably have them back. Yeah. 
uh, it, it, it'd be very important to do that. Yeah. It would tie right into what we're doing here. Uh, yeah, well, Resilience Grows here has actually had for many years a peer-to-peer a -peer training module yeah. that we've always done in person, but we've just, um, or we're in the final stages of um, creating it as an online format. So somebody can take an online peer training module that talks about working with those who've served in the military. And it's one of the things that we've always trained our families in. Because just because you've got a loved one who's served doesn't mean you know everything about how to best support them. Yeah. So, you know, when, when we launch that, it'd be great for us to come back and talk a little bit more about that. But it's a really important thing is to skill your caregivers mm -hmm. and to skill your community. Because if your community doesn't support your veteran, then who will? Exactly. Exactly. What you said about caregiver burnout, that is, I would like to expand on that sure. more, but you also mentioned why a family member or a caregiver might resist raising their hand and also asking for help. So why, what is that barrier? And also, how does caregiver burnout relate to veterans? Sure. So caregiver burnout can happen veteran to veteran. So veteran peers are incredibly protective of one another. It's kind of yes. that battle buddy theory. It is. And if you've got a, a, a buddy that's not coping, your desire to, f to, to protect them and to support them is overwhelming. It's, it's what you're conditioned to do. But over time, particularly if someone's struggling for long periods of time, there's a burnout factor that goes with that. So recognizing that it's no one person's job to support another. We've, we've, we've got to have that, we call it um, in suicide prevention or in mental health, we call it a chain of survival. Yeah. So you take this watch and then you're gonna, you're gonna tap me in and then I'm gonna take this watch and now it's your turn. So that everybody gets an opportunity to rest and everybody gets an opportunity to be able to um, to recuperate and, and find a way to be the very best caregiver and the very best support that they can be. But Megan, doubling back on why some of our caregivers don't ask for help, so it's, it's twofold. One, by asking for help you are now admitting that there's a problem and by admitting there's a problem it means that your veteran is struggling. So you're, often they'll say, I feel like I'm betraying them. Mm. So it's my job to protect them by saying there's an issue I'm betraying them to somebody else. So that's one factor. Well, hold on, let's, let's, uh, yeah. it, are they betraying? Absolutely not, absolutely not. But you know, you think about loving somebody and knowing the, the often not all, but much of what they've had to see and feel and experience, you're there at night when they wake up with night terrors, you're there in a social situation where they're struggling, so you know that there is a huge underlying burden that they're carrying. You don't want to add to that by announcing it to the world. And the misconception is by asking for help, you're not announcing it to the world, you're actually bringing in reinforcements. You're actually bringing in reinforcements that can help you to help the person you love the most. Yeah. That's important. I mean, it is dealing with, you know, as a veteran, um, and also someone that worked in the first responder field, mm -hmm. uh, corrections. Uh, you know, it, it's it, it, it's all bringing. It's, it makes Bring sense. It I'm, 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 yeah, I'm listening to everything you're saying, and yeah, it's bringing a lot, a lot of stuff back. Yeah, and you know, the other the other part, the other the other side of that coin is for a, a family member to say, "I need help. I'm not coping." Yeah. Why am I not coping? I didn't go to war. Mm -hmm. What right do I have not to be coping? I stayed home. They went to war. He or she went to war. They saw all of the terrible things. That what they're struggling with is the price of service. What right do I have to have needs? My job is to, to, to hold everything together. But what people forget is by asking for help, it actually helps them to hold it together. And it helps them become a better caregiver. Absolutely. You, because you are calling those reinforcements that will give Absolutely. you the tools in order to give those tools and share them with the veteran who is also in need. Absolutely. But, you know, a lot of it is, is rewiring the way we think about asking for help. And we've talked, I think, I think in the last show and in many shows before about stigma. And we've got to reverse the stigma of asking for help with mental health challenges. You know, if someone's got diabetes and they're having a sugar low, they ask for help. <laughs> exactly. I need orange juice. Yeah. I'm, I'm having a hypo. They don't think twice about asking for help. No. If someone's got cancer and needs a ride to chemotherapy, they ask for help. It's no different. It's, it's a physical 
a health challenge or a mental health challenge is the same need. It's yeah. just a different organ of the body. And that's why your, your work is so important because you are helping to break down the stigma and also normalize the conversation totally. of mental health. And it is still tricky to talk about because we're still learning so much about the human brain, but what you do know, we need to share. Absolutely. Well, you know, I often like to talk about, I, I use the, the, the physical mental comparison all the time. Just because Scott, someone's got diabetes doesn't mean they're broken. It means they've got diabetes and they have to make some concessions in their life to deal with the disease. If someone who's got mental health challenges aren't mentally broken. They have some challenges that we need to make some concessions for so they can lead their best life. It's no different. Okay. It's the same conversation. It's just a different organ of the body. As the first show, this one's come to an end. Oh my goodness, uh, where does the time go? It, it's, it, would you like to talk about the, the classes again? Yeah, probably not a bad idea. So it's 2022 in case we're replaying this 20 years into the future. Um, we have two suicide prevention trainings that are actually going to be free and are being uh, sponsored by the uh, Resilience Grows here and held at the Farmington Valley Health District in Canton. Our first date is August the 25th, 2022, from 6 to 8 p.m. And the other is September the 22nd, 2022, from 6 to 8 p.m. again at the Farmington Valley Health District in Canton. Um, and if you'd like to enrol, it's free. Uh, feel free to give the Farmington Valley Health District a call. Uh, our number is 860-352-2333, extension 312. And feel free to register. We'd love to have you to come along and to teach you some of those really important skills about being um, literate in mental health. Well, Justine, as always, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so um, much. Thank you for having yeah. me. I, I mean, uh, it'd be nice if maybe we can have you back once a month and there's so many updates. Sure. The program that's coming up uh, that, that you the were talking about. The peer-to-peer training, yeah, yep, yeah. absolutely. Um, it, it'd be great to be able to do that. Uh, with that being said, uh, another great <laughs> show. Uh, we want to thank the viewers for watching. Uh, see you next time in the Veterans Corner. Good night. Good night. Good night. The Saybrook Fish House in Canton has been serving fresh seafood, chicken, and steak entrees for 34 years, offering three cozy dining room settings, a newly renovated pub with craft beer, wine by the glass, specialty cocktails, and a lighter fare menu. Open for lunch and dinner seven days a week. Reservations accepted for parties of 2 to 42, and gift certificates are also available. The Saybrook Fish House, nestled at the crossroads of Route 44, 202, and 179 in Canton.